Compared to the embassies that James had been shown during his tour of the station, the building housing the Tornastracis affairs were a lot more held back when it came to design. Cold, barren steel formed the walls of the box-shaped building, but it was well maintained and treated, radiating a great deal of pride that was held in keeping order while the station's cold, artificial light reflected from its polished surface. James's mind buzzed with possible outcomes of all of this, and his anxious thoughts kept falling down dark holes, ending in worst case scenarios. At least he hoped it was anxiety speaking in those cases. The vague outline of the reflection of his pale face looked back at him from the tightly sealed doors as a bright blot of colour on the dark grey surface. He took a deep breath while staring at the door. Something in him rebelled against opening it, a weak feeling in his gut telling him to best turn around and try to solve things on his own. Quickly, he shook his head, mentally slapping himself. Don't lose your head, he told himself in his mind. You know where losing your call gets you. This is not the time for mental blockades, so pull yourself together. Door, open up, he quickly ordered loudly, before his head could throw him a wrench into things. The mountain of metal heeded his call, and the pneumatic signature, hiss, rang out as the metal parts were slowly pulled apart. As soon as the barrier separating him from the inside had made way, rough, agitated voices could be heard coming from the room. James didn't speak the language the Tanusha sites were arguing in, but one of the two had the Martian dialect, as their people called it, so he had probably spent some time in the human territory. However, it sounded quite serious, whatever they were talking about. Stepping into the room, the first noticeable thing was the floor. The metal forming the ground under his feet was textured in the way that imitated rough stone, forming a stark contrast to the immaculate walls that were lacquered with a reflective purple paint, and just as polished as the ones on the outside. Similar to the matriarch's office, the waiting area of the embassy was also equipped with large futon-like couchettes that were placed in uneven intervals throughout the room that could be used by visitors that were waiting to be dealt with, although all of them were empty at this time. The agitated conversation originated from two full-sized tonastrocytes at the large counter on the other side of the room, and what James assumed to be a tonastrocyte ambassador, or their assistant, was seemingly dealing with a rather displeased visitor. Looking at the two, James needed a double-take, didn't he know one of them? The man behind the counter, who was slightly smaller and leaner than the arguing guest, and also had a more purple hue in the dark colourings of his armour plates, exasperatedly opened his mouth, his long tongue swinging through the air, as two of their intense eyes fell onto him while scanning through the room. I will be right with you, he called out to James in galactic uniform, turning his head to look over to him, while two of his eyes kept their focus on the other man, who also seemed to zero in on James. Ambassador! The larger man now called out, laboriously turning on the spot to face James. So his eyes had not deceived him. It was really his brief acquaintance from the bar. At least he had a good idea why the man might be visiting the embassy. Greetings! How was your meeting with the High Matriarch? Ambassador, the other man parroted, his eyes bouncing back and forth between James and the other man. Quite the good memory on that guy, James had to admit. Exhausting. He asked casually, hoping to quickly be able to dismiss the conversation. The Tornastracite bellowed amusedly, the large claws of his front mauler scratching across the rough floor, causing a nauseating sound that gave James the shivers. The leader one behind the counter now looked even more interested in the exchange. That's the man you were talking about, Konglok? He suspiciously inquired while studying James a bit more thoroughly. Konglok turned his head towards him, then he had a smug sounding hiss. Indeed. He replied fictitiously, wagging his tail almost like an excited dog. He's the reason why I'm here. James could feel his right leg nervously bob in place. As much as he usually enjoys some friendly banter, he didn't really have time for this. Right, sorry about that. He cuts in before the other Tanesha could retort. I hope that you're not having too much trouble because of that. Although if I think about it, you would have had it coming. Nothing we aren't used to around here. The man behind the counter replied, and Kongrosh is stead, and his gaze to check something on a screen attached to said counter. But couldn't you have picked a better time to send him to us? I haven't been able to get rid of him for a day because of these technical difficulties. James poked up at that. Technical difficulties? He asked, and walked up closer, stepping right next to Kongrosh, who immediately patted him on his back with one of his huge hands. Can't be rooted here for a day longer than expected, he said, a bit annoyed, but seemed to overall be a good sport about it. How so? James further inquired, trying to match the conversation's casual tone, although he noticed Kongrosh's expression changing in the corner of his vision. What, you don't know? The man behind the counter said, two of his eyes squinting to the side to look James in the eyes, 
while his general gaze remained locked on the computer screen. I thought you were here because of that. James awkwardly scratched the back of his head as he looked up at the large man. Well, the whole ambassador deal is really more of a title than a job, all things considered, he admitted with a sheepish chuckle. It came in handy that one time with our little brawl, but otherwise I'm not really kept in the loop or anything. Confused, the person who James was increasingly sure was an ambassador by now, looked up and all four of his eyes focused in. Then, the light of understanding slowly seemed to creep into his gaze. Ah, oh, you must be Aldwin then, he exclaimed, bellowing. The Dancer's new Star Explorer. I've heard about you. Didn't know you were on the station. At least that clears up why there's suddenly a human ambassador around without anyone knowing about it. Confused us quite a bit when Conglor showed up yesterday talking big about a duel with a human ambassador. And I told you I wasn't imagining things, Conglor retorted, holding his head up high, writing himself up to his full enormous height. Lovely. So his name was a bit further out there than he had expected. That was something that he would have to cope with later. Yep, that would be me, James responded, and quickly tried to stir the conversation back into a more sensible direction. But anyway, you were saying something about technical difficulties? In an uncharacteristic gesture, the lean giant bobbed his head up and down in a nod. Yep, and plenty of them, he answered. I reached over to the screen, turning it around so James could look at it. Which wasn't easy, as the countertop was still located higher than his eye level. However, he did manage to just about pick up what he was showing him. Apparently something or someone managed to somehow wreck the fusion satellite powering the hyperspace stretch of the entire Orion arm. So that's a disaster and a half. We've lost all contact to our home systems for the moment. Makes working things out with our governments a bit complicated, as you can probably imagine. For a moment, James's breath got stuck in his throat. Communication to the entire Orion arm? All completely cut off? That's at least very much explained why the remote Earth embassy wasn't in working order, and he could only imagine what kind of chaos this was causing on Earth. Not noticing James's mood swing, the ambassador happily kept explaining. They're already trying to fix it, but apparently it's going to take a while, and until then, we're on our own, James concluded for him, suddenly feeling extremely exposed, like a mouse in the middle of a giant field, and above him, the hawks were already starting to circle. Well, if you want to be dramatic about it, the ambassador bellowed, and turned his screen back into a position comfortable for his work. I was going to say we're on paid vacation. James let out an audible sigh and started to the ground, trying to think of what to do next. Suddenly he felt a pressure as a massive hand closed around his right shoulder. Could it be that this brave thing has inadvertently also brought you here today, Dancer? Conglor cast him, the two of his eyes facing James narrowing in on the human. Oh, if only he knew. Kinda, yeah, he said, sticking his thumbs into his pockets and letting his arms hang, or throwing his head backwards to look up at the lizard's giant face. Although, I guess I'm out of luck there. Seems like you're about as destitute as I am around here. Ouch! Well, it's hurt, you know. The ambassador amusedly hissed, looking at him with only one eye. At that point, his past among humans came through in full force in his speech. That earned him a disparaging look from two of Congrosh's eyes, while the other two kept staring at James. Something you need assistance with, Dancer, he asked, and James could feel his grip on his shoulder tighten slightly. Oh, you know, just starting to feel the noose tighten around my neck, James thought to himself, awkwardly shoving his feet as he stared off into space. Well, I'll handle it somehow. He lied and tried to laugh it off, although he was slowly reaching his wit's end. Just what was he up against? Suddenly he was really glad that he had sent his friends away from him. Sorry about that. If you want me to, I can give you a call once it's all up and running again, the ambassador offered, with a candid head tilt while lifting his tower to point upwards. James set out a long exhale. No, that won't be necessary, he said, while pretending that the polished wall was exceedingly interesting at that moment. The Lizardor lifted his huge arms to an implied shrug before fully returning his attention to the computer screen. Conglorch, on the other hand, seemed intrigued by James's implied struggles, if it was only because he had become bored of his own current situation. James closed his eyes tightly, reaching one hand up to his face. All right, think, James. The Tonastrotite embassy is out. The other embassies have been handled, and Earth is as far out of reach as it'll ever be. What to do next? He asked himself, his hands starting to slightly tremble at his forehead. He was running out of options. Come on. Think back to your training. A shudder went through his body. Did he really just think that? Had he fallen that far already? Oh well. He might as well use it, if it had come that far. As far as he was concerned, he was behind enemy lines at this point. Breathing deeply, he brought himself into a space of mind that he had not entered for some years now. One that he would have preferred to stay out of. 
However, this little game of cat and mouse had evolved into something much more serious, and all signs pointed to him having no room to goof around anymore. Slowly, he brought his thoughts in order. What was he feeling? He was afraid, but probably less than he should be. He was a lot more nervous. He was also angry, but probably less than would be expected from him. Mostly, he was just disappointed. Disappointed and annoyed. Did all of this really have to happen right as he finally managed to stand on his own? And even more, couldn't they just take a hint and bother someone else? It's not like the ambassador title they bestowed onto him themselves would be of any use to them. Were they after something else? Maybe someone. But did they even know about anything else? Nothing about him was a secret, exactly. But it also hadn't come up at any point yet. No, this had to be about him, he was quite certain. But he didn't know if he found that reassuring or concerning. Whatever feeling it was, he connected with it, brought it to the forefront of his mind and let it spread through him, although with everything else occupying him at that moment, slowly he brought them into harmony with his thoughts, and slowly let it turn into drive. With a long exhale, he opened his eyes again. They closed down the embassy, cut off communication to not only Earth, but all of Orion. Fine. If they wanted to play, they would play. And he already had a good idea where he would start. Uh, thank you for your time, but I have some things to attend to now he said, turning on the spot and waving goodbye in passing, while softly pushing Congloch's hand off his shoulder. Farewell. Uh, success to you, Mr. Aldwin, the ambassador hesitantly said while looking after him confusedly. Congloch looked after him for a moment and then shouted something in his mother tongue. The ambassador answered something perplexedly, and a very short argument broke out before loud footsteps and a scratching on the rough floor announced the massive man following him. James waited before the massive door had closed behind the two of them before he dressed the eager Lizardor, whose intense gaze was burning into the back of his head at this point. A thought popped up in his mind. If these people had paid Sky, maybe his Lizardor friend had gotten a similar motivation. It was far-fetched, but that was true for this entire situation. You really shouldn't follow me, he said, without turning towards him. Do I strike you as the kind of person that is interested in making good decisions? The giant asked him, his low bellow starting up again. No, you don't, James replied, a grin creeping over his face inadvertently. In what was a quite rare occurrence, Rebrieg stood relaxed, leaning against the wall of the bullet train as he shot through the station at high speeds, watching Hyphety walk nervously back and forth along the cart. Finally, he let out a breath for his trunk and disparagingly said, Could you settle down? You're making me nervous. His colleague gave him a sharp look with her piercing blue eyes, her barely visible pupils narrowing down on him. You all want to talk, she snappily replied, as her many arms were filling with each other in irritation. How come your calmness personified all of a sudden? In case you haven't noticed, our mission is seriously in danger here. Reprie just snorted at that, his trunk fluttering up in amusement. Well, if I'm not mistaken, then our mission has been a failure for a long time, if not from the very start. I don't see why I should be getting all riled up about it now, he explained. I waved off Hyper's concerns. The freak is on to us, so what? I've watched him for months, and honestly, I don't think he was ever in any favourable position. So what's with the anxiety? This is always a possibility, wasn't it? Hyferty, who apparently wasn't even thinking of slowing down in her constant back and forth, shook her big head and tore her eyes off Reprieg, bringing one of her thin arms up to the plate covering her face. Technically it was, of course, but he seemed to be such a good candidate. Losing him would be a big setback, and that's without even considering the amount of resources we have already invested into him. She mumbled absently, the strums of her voice dulled by her concern. But this could mean that it's possible that nearly all of our data so far was falsified, and even if it wasn't, who knows what kind of fallout him finding out about the mission could have done down the line. It's a good thing we cut communications just in case, or it is possible that the mission in its entirety could have been jeopardized, not just our part. I just still don't get how this could even happen. Reprieve looked up at her appalled. A good candidate? Are we talking about the same target here? Have you even read my reports? He asked, pushing himself off the wall and stepping closer towards her, still following her with his gaze. We may have no idea where he discovered the surveillance, but I had him under watch around the damn clock. He was problematic from day one and things only got worse from there. Some of that may have been fake, but no way he was playing his role at all times. Finally, Hyphati stopped in her tracks, looking back at Reprieve with suppressed... Disappointment? Was she being serious right now? And whatever gave you that idea, she responded, crossing some of her thin arms while pointing others directly at him. He sighed. Do I have to spell it out for you? He asked her, annoyed. That would be nice, she replied, starting to regain some of her sass back, her voice also slowly returning to its usual melodic form. 
but Preeg wasn't quite sure if she should be happy about that. However, he complied nonetheless, starting to list. Well, on his very first day, he got his arm cut open, and decided that the best course of action would be to just sew it shut and act like it didn't happen. Haifa waved it off with two of her arms, saying, He avoided conflict in a new work environment and got into good graces with someone outranking him on board. You can hardly call that problematic. It's hardly enough to pull it off, after all. Stroking his hands over his trunk agitatedly, Repri continued, as if he hadn't heard her remarks. After that, he attached himself to just about the most problematic crew member on board, right before diving into a burning hellscape to risk his life to save an abomination that another team was trying to remove, and attaching himself to it as well, basically grunting it immunity for the time being in the process. A string orchestra suddenly playing in the cabin informed him that she found his way of phrasing it quite amusing. Well, that wasn't really his fault. He couldn't have known what he was doing there. For him, he was just saving a life after all, and stuff like that connects people, she retorted placing two of her arms on the plate covering her stomach. And when it comes to our dear petty officer, you have to admit that she got quite a bit more personable after he came around. The same thing with the cyborg. He seems to have a soothing effect on oddities. I mean, in the end, even our own little rascal seemed to be quite taken by him, don't you think? She whispered that last part, leaning in closer to Reprieg to make sure he could hear her while pointing over his shoulder with one arm. Reprieg didn't need to look to know that she was pointing towards Sky, who was absently sitting in the corner of the cabin, with some form of earphones stuffed into her multi-flapped ears. The thief had indeed expressed a certain interest in the person of their target, after she had discovered the espionage device in his room, although Reprieg had mostly written that off as a faint hint of welcome professionalism on her part. Although admittedly, thinking about the low life's general behaviour, Hyphody's explanation did make a lot more sense. He did have to give her that. Shaking the thoughts of possible implications this might have out of his head, he decided to stay on topic for now, mentioning, Speaking of rascals, what about his altercation with the Tonastrocyte? You got any smart excuses for that as well? Another round of plug strings erupted from Hypha T. That I do, my dear Reprieg, that I do, she impishly replied, and reached out to Jenny Brush across the fur on his neck with an amused look in her eyes. Or well, have you forgotten that the altercation happened because the Tonastrocyte challenged your oh so scary monster at first? Reprieg turned up his trunk at her smug tone. And what about it? he asked inquisitively. Well, he saw a conflict between oddities that would have most certainly ended in severe injuries, and what did he do? She asked teasingly. Her zest for life had returned in full force by now, and Reprieg almost had to hold back a smile. Seeing her all down had been unsettling. It was good that she had returned to normal, even if that meant he would have had to endure her tantalizations again. Shaking his head, he indicated for her to continue, simply stating, Enlighten me. Tilting her head in delight, she obliged. Well, he used his diplomatic knowledge on one hand and his personal influences on the other to defuse the situation and pacify both of the auditors in one go. All that, and he also managed to subdue it to Nashashai barehanded, meaning that he gained his people's respect already. And quite the achievement if you think about it, don't you think? She listed off, supporting each of her points with an elegant movement of one of her many arms. This time it was Reprieve's turn to actually crack up laughing. Are you sure you're not just seeing what you want to see? He asked. Tilting his head sideways to look at Hyphen more precisely. Remember, I was there. To me, it seemed the freak just saw an easy opportunity for a quick brawl and jumped on it. Hyphen swayed her head left to right, looking at him intently. Could it be that you're projecting a bit? It seems that you're also seeing what you want to see, she replied teasingly. In the end, the chances were good that both of them were right in the way. That or neither of them. However, he wasn't quite willing to admit that yet. Sure, keep telling yourself that. Reprieve said, and feigned annoyance, turning away from Hyfer to go lean against the wall again. Hyfer only responded with a laugh at first, watching him slowly walk away from her. Finally, she ended with a deep, drawn-out breath. Thank you, Reprieve, she said, stroking across her face plate with three of her arms while straightening herself up to her full height. He merely audibly exhaled some air through his trunk as an answer, wiggling it in place for a moment and turning his gaze away. It inadvertently landed on Sky, who still sat in the corner, a strange expression on her face. Could it be? He suddenly walked over towards the thief, stepping up and towering over her. She kept her eyes closed, pretending not to notice him. Going out at a whim, Reprieve casually stated, You heard every word, am I right? Those things aren't even turned on, are they? For a second longer, the scoundrel tried to keep up her facade. However, her face soon broke into an impish expression, before she pulled out the earphones and turned her gaze towards him. What gave it away? She asked, without acknowledging his accusation in a meaningful way. 
I noticed you staring at me every time you felt unobserved, he replied dryly, looking down at her unamused. Darn! You're more perceptive than I gave you credit for, Slowpoke! Skye laughed and shook her long head. Good for you! Without knowing it, Skye's statement had struck a chord with Reprieg, and he immediately turned away from her as she was stuffing the phones back in her ears. He learned a thing or two about underestimating somebody's perceptiveness by now. You're in the loop now. No need to try and eavesdrop where we can talk right in front of you, he said, while slowly skulking back to his previous place. Don't let me catch you doing something like that again. As just about everyone could have guessed, Sky quietly answered. Won't let you catch me, alright? Just as Rapig wanted to finally get back into his relaxed position, a sudden shift of momentum, accompanied by the sound of metal grinding against metal, announced that they were quickly approaching their destination. How fitting. Well... Let's just hope all this damn work hasn't been for naught, shall we? He suggested, already getting ready in front of the exit door, right next to Hyper T. Quite the opposite, she answered, loosening up her posture slightly. Let's hope things will go so smoothly that we're completely overprepared. But where's the fun in that? Skye, who has suddenly appeared next to him, butted in. Reprieve took a deep breath. Let's just get this over with, he said dismissively, shaking out his fur and waiting for the steadily slowing cart to finally come to a stop. No matter the outcome, one way or the other, this mission would end very soon. Letting out a drawn out breath, Moore sunk into one of the exceedingly comfortable armchairs that were provided in the Raphaelite's embassy's waiting area. It had been a while since she had sat in one of these, and her old bones thanked her for it. All of the stress had done a number on her. The dark figure on the screen of her assistant moved unsurely, scratching along the long, dark fur of his neck as he looked back at her. Those are some very serious accusations, Mum, Mooing mumbled, turning his head to directly look at the screen with one eye. And you are sure you can trust what this man is saying? It sounds a bit far-fetched to me. With another long exhale, Moore deflected even further into the cushions of the chair. If I am being honest, I do not know what to believe anymore, she answered, slowly combing through her fur with her claws. But everything James said makes sense. And at least she does seems to completely agree with all of it. Make of that what you will. All of that seems to me like it is at least warrant some looking into. It cannot do any harm after all. And Shida was the Miad, correct? Wing slowly answered, seeming to be quite preoccupied with remembering the amount of information she was currently unloading onto him with no warning. She groaned as an answer before softly chuckling to herself. Marine also laughed before leaning out of frame and rummaging through something, while absently saying, I have to say, I didn't expect you to be keeping such interesting company any time soon, Mum, he said, while pulling out some papers. Sounds like an exciting situation, although I'm afraid I can't be of much more help than listening to it. Moore shook her head, her fur rusting in the quiet room. I am just glad you're in communication range so I have someone to talk to. She responded, and decided that maybe a change of topic was in order, to get her mind off things while the employees of the embassy handled her request. Speaking of interesting company, how is Zarabi doing? Buing visibly flinched as his mother brought up his newlywed wife out of nowhere. He probably still had her previous reaction freshly in his mind. She tuckled loudly again. Oh, now do not get all jumpy because of me. I just want to know how my new daughter-in-law is doing she said, laughing, and made a calming gesture with one of her claws. Moeen looked at her suspiciously as he replied, Right, well, Zarabi is settling in fine. Life in space is still pretty new for her, so there are some hurdles every now and then. But she's hardy, and we're managing just fine. Just yesterday, she thought she would go look at the stars. She used to love to do that when she was planet size, you know. Anyway, she didn't quite think that through and just stared out of a window. It gave her quite the shock and had me really worried. Well, I have to admit, I can imagine worse things than spending the evening comforting her. A rookie mistake, Moore confirmed, nodding. Good thing you were there for her. She remembered back when she had only recently boarded the spaceship for the first time. Stargazing had been a hobby of hers once too. However, she too had to quickly learn that staring out of the star-side window of a spaceship was not the same calming experience as looking at a beautiful night sky. Spending an evening in the medical wing of your new interstellar home after unwittingly coming face to face with the abyss that is the void was a frightfully common occurrence among the recently space-bound. Well, 
among normal people that is, she had to admit to herself with a smile. People who didn't absently stumble onto a star side window without noticing it, and didn't care once they looked down. Or slept on top of one to remain undisturbed, or find it plain calming to stare out into the endless emptiness. She really did keep interesting company recently. Anyway, even at the risk of changing this favourable turn of events, I have to ask, how come you suddenly seem to be so amicable when it comes to Zerabi? Wuin asked carefully, pulling her out of her train of thought. Well, you could say my interest in company has put things into perspective for me, she replied amusingly, and exhaled loudly from her nose. Also, it seems that bigger problems came up, and I would rather have my family on my side than fight over something that I should never have tried to fight in the first place. Do not get me wrong, I still very much do not agree with how you did it, but I should never have made it about the wedding itself. And if Sarabi was not a lovely person, I am sure you would not have married her. Moeen was silent for a moment, as he looked at his screen in surprise. Then his expression slightly changed, and he tilted his head sideways. Thank you, Mum, he finally said in a relieved tone. And it almost sounds like I should thank your friends as well. Before she knew it, Moore's heart had skipped a beat, as she felt it get heavy. She knew she had raised that boy right. I am sure that could be arranged sometime, she answered softly. Moeen seemingly wanted to reply, however in that moment one of the embassy's employees stepped up to her, willlessly indicating that her request was now processed and she will be assisted now. Forgive me, but I have to hang up, she quickly excused herself to Moeen. Success to you. Wait a moment, Mum. Moeen suddenly piped up, making her look down on the screen quizzically one more time. I know that we don't know the full story yet, but in my experience, humans seem to have things figured out. Sounds like you have quite a bit to tell me later, Moore said, looking at her son suspiciously. However, the work had now indicated for her to please hurry, so she had to cut any further talk short. I have to go now, she said, reaching for the hang-up option. Success to you, Wuin just about managed to get out before his connection was cut. Looking at her, please, the worker gave a very short bow. If you would follow me now... The old woman said politely. Laboriously, Moore pushed herself up, using the massive armrest of the chair that she had melted into. Hopefully, this would all be over precaution on their part, she thought, as she was guided to the ambassador's office by the employee. However, after all that had happened, she could just not help that sinking feeling weighing her down in her stomach area. The doors of the train opened with a pneumatic hiss as commuters entered and exited the car to hurriedly reach their destination. The eyes of the entering passengers wandered through the interior for a moment, possibly in search for a free place to spend their drive. However, soon, every one of their gazes landed on the two of them at some point. The familiar shift in the expressions that was typical for somebody unexpectedly lame eyes and curie was visible on their faces without fail. They were used to it by now, although today of all days, it seemed that their gazes were particularly piercing. Or maybe it was because today had been a day like this that their gazes felt particularly grating. Either option was as likely as the other. Maybe they would have to look into such possible effects at some point, but that would have to be later. Looking to their right, Curie had originally expected to see Shida cast her typically venomous glares back at the prying eyes of their fellow passengers. However, it seemed that the feline was strangely absent today, as she stood lazily against the car's window, gazing out of it with half-hanging ears. Her gaze was similar to that of James when he was working on a particularly strange finding in his laboratory. It looked concentrated, but not on the thing right before her, but on something that Curie could not make out. Additionally, it carried another subdued emotion that Curie could never discern. Her absentness carried on even after they had left the train, and all the way to the Rushkak Hive Complex. However, as they ascended the stairs onto the top of the complex, a strange sight pulled her out of her thoughts. Curie studied the Mias gaze, then it turned sharp once more without warning, and followed it to a large figure standing some distance away from them, on top of one of the many room's hash doors. Judging by the distance, the insectoids stood taller than Shida. Their wide thorax, housing livery wings on his back, showed signs of strong musculature under the exoskeleton. Long, sharp spines covered each of their legs, the foremost pair of which was elongated, his tarsi formed into strong-looking maulers. The mandibles on their face were also strongly enlarged. The person seemed to be different from the other Rush Gak that could be seen scuttling across the complex. And another look at Shida clued Curie into one thing. That is your room, isn't it? They asked, while taking another look at the large insectoid specimen. Yep, 
Shida replied, smacking her lips in annoyance before resolutely stepping forward and continuing towards said room. Kiri hurriedly scuttled after her, trying to figure out what they would do now. Shida seemed to be even more taciturn than usual, so it was on them to try and read the situation. And right now, they had no idea what was going on. The large Rouge Gak noticed them getting closer, and turned towards Shida, raising one of their large claws as a greeting, and simultaneously indicating for them to halt. Is there a problem? Shida tonelessly asked the person and crossed her arms. I would like to enter my room now. The person repeatedly waved their arms in a placatory gesture, and took a step backwards. Then they brought their arms forward and signed. Can't talk. Please wait. Worker will come. Interesting. Apparently the polymorphism in their forex and mandibles meant that this version of the species could not produce the necessary speech patterns for the Galactic Uniform language. A slight twitch in the fingers of Shida's right hand indicated a rising of nervousness within her. However, she still waited for the worker to arrive, staring down the large person in front of them the whole time. Please forgive the soldier, he was merely placed as a guard, the Rushgag worker said once they closed in on them. And why exactly did our room need a guard? Shida replied, looking the new arrival up and down suspiciously. Kuri could not help but notice the absence of a greeting in this conversation. The insectoid tilted their head, studying Shida with their four compound eyes before their eyes also fell onto Kuri, although they quickly seemed to disregard them after giving them a once-over. It was decided that it would be necessary for the safety of the ambassador, the worker answered matter-of-factly. How considerate of them. However, what did they expect to have to protect James from? Shida had a very different reaction her eyes narrowing as they kept contact with the worker's gaze. I don't recall him ever mentioning being an ambassador around here, she stated sharply, and her posture turned hostile, the muscle in her arms and legs tensing up. However, the insectoid seemed to be mostly confused by her reaction. It was part of the data package linked to his genetic code. It was sent to us after he checked in, they explained calmly, and lowered their body and limbs into a submissive posture. We were quite surprised that it was not mentioned to us, but a human ambassador is a high guess that we are more than pleased to welcome in our hive nonetheless. Shida still seemed suspicious, however she dropped her aggressive posture. And how did you get the idea that he needed protection? She pried further, leaning closer towards the worker. An easy explanation, the worker answered, writing themselves up to their full height again and surely shaking up their wings. An unknown entity tried to gain access to your room while you were away. This usually would suggest a thief trying to plunder hotel rooms and security was informed, However, the ambassador's status made the Hive decide that additional measures should be taken to ensure the security of his room and his person. An unknown entity trying to get access uninvited? Given the circumstances and past events, that did sound like a problem. She just seemed to think the same thing if her expression was anything to go by. Her ears stood up straight at attention, and her tail agitatedly swayed around. She seemed to be quite focused on the situation. Because of that, she didn't notice the faint footsteps, slowly closing in on their conversation. Curie, however, did very much notice, and turned towards the noise, beholding two large men, casually approaching them in a leisurely quadrupedal walk. Any information about the perpetrator yet? She asked, staring at the worker intensely. However, the worker and the soldier had both noticed the approaching men, writing themselves up to standard attention as they got closer. Maybe we could help clear that up, the deep voice of one of the men calmly suggested, with a low chuckle. Just as Shida surprisingly shot around to see what the Rushgak were reacting to, her eyes springing wide open once she laid eyes on them. The men were now within a reasonable range for conversation, and pushed themselves up on two legs once more. One of them was a large, shielded, sharp cedar with a long neck. And the other was a very familiar primate, who nodded towards Kuri and Shida with a sly smile as he righted himself up. Councilmen, the two Rushgak greeted the large reptile with a respectful bow. Captain, Shida mumbled, coming face to face with her long-time commander. Hello, Shida, the captain answered softly, while his companion, who appeared to be a councilman, softly chuckled. I think we need to talk. 